Our last presentation will be by Dr. Daniel Jones from uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Well, thank you. Uh, my job is to try to get us all engaged. Um, so first, is, if there's any empty seats next to you, can you raise your hand so the guys in the back know where to go? All right, we got a couple seats there. So anyone in the back who wants to come in, come on in. Now, we just saw some beautiful, beautiful videos from Dr. Brunt and Dr. Schweisberg. But now what I want to do is sort of back up and go step by step. Now, we got probably getting close to 500 of you out there. And if you're a SAGES member and you're here, you're probably close to an expert on hernia. So what we want to do is get you to help me challenge their ideas and notions and things that they're doing, but also to share your ideas. So we have some microphones that I'm going to need your help. So why not just do these open, Steve? <clears throat> well, the, the open operation is an interesting operation from the past. Um, <laughs> well, when would you do an open? So, so my general philosophy on, on laparoscopic surgery is to make easy surgery easier on the patient. So if somebody walks into my office with a great big scrotal hernia and he wants a laparoscopic approach, I go, well, you know, I can do it, uh, but it's really not the right operation for you because, you, you know, when you have to dig a sac that's way down in the scrotum out, there's more bleeding, and you lose some of the benefits of, of laparoscopy. It turns into a longer operation. So I have some size uh, considerations that I will re reject patients for. I mean, I can climb the mountain, but it's not making easy surgery easier on the patient. If if the patient is has has nothing that they have a reason that they're really looking for an earlier recovery, if an 82 year old patient with heart disease, you know, comes into into my office and he's had you know two laparotomies for bowel obstruction then I'm going, I have no reason to be in your abdomen when you're 82 when I could do this you know, for a half an hour using open technique. So I, I will occasionally do patients that have had previous surgery. I'll do a tap on them. I do my recurrences as a tap, but I do all the virgin hernias tap wherever possible because it's, it's so much easier and convenient once you get used to working in the small space. So I'm, I have a set of criteria that I reject people on. But, but really, if somebody walks up to me and has a unilateral hernia, and they don't have a, one of those rejection criteria, I'll, op I'll offer them a laparoscopic repair if they're interested. But what I'm looking to do is to tailor my operation to the patient. So some patients want to not be asleep. I can't do it laparoscopically. Some patients want the standard operation. I will do a standard open hernia repair for them. But for those patients that are looking for a minimally uh, invasive approach with, without a contraindication, I'll do it laparoscopically for a couple of reasons. Number one, I believe in the operation. I've done a 1,000 of them. My very, very best results are all in the laparoscopic group as, as a group. I have no patients who played softball the day after their hernia repair in my open hernia group. I have no patients who rode their bicycle the weekend after surgery in my open hernia group. So I have some really good open hernia, but my spectacular results are in the laparoscopic group. But more important is 15% of the time, you will find an unsuspected clinically uh, appropriate anatomically real hernia, and you can spare the patient a second operation under those circumstances, particularly if they're a little heavier and they're a little harder to examine. That's very real. And those, they don't put any staples on the, on the unoperated side, so you spare them a second operation. When, when I first started doing this in 1993, I would come across these patients occasionally, and I wouldn't fix it because we, it was too new, we didn't want to do harm, and invariably, all patients who had a real hernia on the opposite side came back for hernia repair sometime within the next you know, year or two. So my probably most important reason is 15% of the time you'll be glad that you were there so you could do both sides. So, Mike, you had a disposable trocar. You had the tackers. Is it going to cost more to do this laparoscopic? Well, yes, it will cost a bit more. But maybe I should uh, uh, respond to okay. what uh, Steve said uh, first because um, I – And, folks, well, not come rebuttal, to the mic if I, you want to disagree with these guys. You know, I think um, – I, I mean, I do uh, 
uh, a lot of open uh, inguinal hernia repairs as well. And uh, I think, I think what, what Dr. Schweisberg said about tailoring the approach to the patient is probably the most important thing for you to take home today. And so it's going to depend on your patient population. It's going to depend on local hernia factors. It's going to depend on uh, intra-abdominal conditions. If somebody is sent to me who's had a previous radical prostatectomy or low anterior resection, there's no way I'm going to choose a laparoscopic approach as my first alternative or something like that. You know, follow the path of least resistance to repair the hernia. An open inguinal hernia repair is a perfectly good operation. There are differences. There is a little bit more pain. But in some patient groups, like elderly men, the difference is not that great between open and laparoscopic. I think, you know, young, athletically active individuals, middle-aged, bilaterals, the difference is much greater. And that certainly pushes, I think, both me and patients more towards uh, doing them uh, laparoscopically. I have the conversation with the patient about the pros and cons of each, and I think you have to be frank about that. Local versus general anesthetic. Some people don't want to be put to sleep, okay? Some people shouldn't be put to sleep, probably, when you have a good alternative. Uh, what is the risk or incidence of chronic pain? Uh, that, that tilts a little bit more towards a uh, laparoscopic approach. What are those numbers? What about urinary retention, okay? Um, what are the risks of chronic pain? Yeah. They're quite low in the in the Cochrane report said group. with open repairs are up to sixty percent. Yeah, is that but true? I, I mean I think that depends on how you ask that question and do the patients ever experience any pain or is it really do they are they having any pain that ha that interferes with their lifestyle? And in, in my experience, that is pretty uncommon after uh, open repair. So, to, to, so, so let me jump let me jump in on that. I think having that pain discussion is really important. You know, I do a lot of redo surgery for other people and I often ask them I said, you know, what did your surgeon tell you about pain? And they said, "Oh, I'll be fine in a week." I have a it's on my consent form. I quote patients that there's a 1 in 500 chance that they will have clinically significant enough pain to go back to the operating room. And and people say, "Well, what do you think has more pain, laparoscopic or open hernia surgery, and the way, I, the way I look at it is, when I do a laparoscopic repair, those two nerves, or the, that the, you know, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the, and the branch of the femoral genital nerve, they're generally covered by a layer of fat. So my mesh generally does not sit directly on the nerve. When you do an open repair in some form of shoulder dice or plug and patch, you know, your, your mesh has to sit directly on the nerve unless you belong to the school where, the, where you cut the nerves, and there are a lot of people that do that. And so there is a pain syndrome that occurs, you know, eight, nine months after the initial repair. They didn't suture the nerve, but it's been caught up into the scar tissue. So one of the other reasons why I do laparoscopic hernia repair is because I really believe from, you know, 25 years and a couple thousand hernia repairs that there's a slightly increased risk over the course of a year of having a little bit more discomfort using the open approach. Uh, we have I, a question I agree, back. I agree, I agree I'm going to have to state. cut off the panel so I can get to the questions. <laughs> Guys, um, as a moderator, I love the question. So name, give Spinell me your name, where you're from, and your question, please. Okay. Jose Espinel from Western Massachusetts. Uh, question regarding the TEP. Uh, if there's any role for uh, prophylactic uh, inguinal hernia repair on the TEP approach on the contralateral side, mm -hmm. and second thing, any role on tactless uh, hernia repair and the TEP approach? Yeah, I, well, the first question first. Contralateral, I, you know, I don't, if I don't feel a clinically detectable hernia on that side, and I'm doing a TEP, I don't go looking and dissecting that space out, because then you violated that space, and if you dissected it out, then, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to put a mesh in there or not? So I don't go looking for it, realizing that there will be occasionally a, a patient who's going to come back with a clinically evident hernia. I think if you're in there, tap, and you see it, then you go ahead and you fix uh, both sides. In regard to the other question about the lack of fixation, there are... Uh, there are some outstanding hernia experts out there that don't use any fixation uh, or that use a fibrin glue or fibrin sealant, okay? I have not been able to make that leap of faith yet where I don't do it. I think one situation in which it probably makes sense is in the females because they usually they have a pretty solid floor. It's not a big, huge space there. I would, be, I would certainly be nervous about uh, not using any fixation in patients who have uh, a sizable direct hernia, though. See, that's one of the reasons why I use the keyhole, is that once you, you can get those to sit nicely. So on the side, if it's one of these surprise hernias, I don't use any fixation on that side. And by, you know, keyholing it around the cord and bringing that little tail over, you kind of, it, it can only spin. It, it can't really go too far. Whereas if you're just doing an overlay, I wouldn't be comfortable without fixation. Yes. 
Hi, Rob Catania from Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, just one little thing, because I was watching on the video when you're doing your tap and talking about you not having enough space with the two hands in, in the uh, mm -hmm. stoplight configuration. If you use PD ports, they have a lower profile on the outside, so they don't bang together as much, so you can actually get your hands a little closer without being obstructed. And the other thing is that is nice is they have a little twist at the bottom so you can pull up and you can't, you don't keep pulling them out like sometimes you'll do with the rib or the disposable or the reusables. Yeah. Um, and also they're cheaper. So yeah. um, uh, questions for TEPs and prostate surgery. It seems like everybody I've seen in the last year who has a hernia has already had their robotic prostate <laughs> total, total prostatectomy. Um, I'm a little hesitant to start getting into the balloon dissection in people who have already had that space completely dissected, and I just want to know if you guys have much experience yeah, with that. I, I, I don't. I try, again, I would, I would preferentially go towards the open approach in somebody like that, but there was a presentation at American Hernia two weeks ago, a video from a surgeon from New Zealand who showed a series of, of, of uh, TEP repairs that he'd done in patients who'd had previous prostatectomy, and they did encounter scarring in that medial side there, uh, but they were able to do it and have very good results. However, most of the panelists commented that probably in that situation a TAP approach made more sense. Okay? It, but, it, but why go into a potentially scarred preperitoneal space when you can do it open? Yeah, and I those are usually right older now. individuals anyway, so why not do them under local with sedation? You'll, it, and you'll be but fine. what are your key points is there is a very clear association between prostate surgery and subsequent hernia. The, the internal That's ring right. shutter mechanism has been disrupted, and so it's very... Uh, common, you know, if these, if it's an older patient, I'll do it open. If for some reason a younger patient has it, then I'd be willing, because I'm going to do a tap, I'd be willing to stick the scope in and take a look. But if it's not feasible, I'm not going to spend two hours and then abandon it. I would, you know, I would, if, it, if it looked easy, I would do it. If not, I would do it open. But, but, but then your patient's asleep already. Right. So, I mean. Who here routinely does tap? Who routinely does tap? Who does open? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we, we all, all do open. open. <laughs> all right. So it looks like everyone's sort of broke. Mike, when you mentioned this before, you said once you do TEP, you never go back. Yeah. Well, I, yes, because it's, it's faster. You don't have to open and close the peritoneum. And uh, early on at our institution, we had two or three patients who had had TEP hernia repairs who uh, herniated bowel and develop gangrenous bowel obstruction through a defect, peritoneal defect, okay? And I have never seen that with a TEP operation. So I think I wrote that up when I was yeah, your resident. You, you may have. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't my cases, though, Dan. So. Just, I know. <laughs> MPC. <laughs> but but I, I think that's the issue. I mean, uh, Dr. Schweitzberg did a beautiful job of closing the peritoneum. But if you're going to do that, you've got to make sure that they're... Um, that, that, the, that you've got it closed securely or not taps, and it's a little harder to do with the spiral tacker, which is what most people use. Steve, rebuttal? Um, yeah, I, I agree. You know, when I started off my career doing taps in the early 90s, and I see you know, some real experts coming up to the podium, so we're going to start shaking in our boots here. But um, once you learn to operate in the smaller space, and for me, because I put my ports out laterally, I have a pretty wide dissection, so I have a pretty good size space. It is just such a thing of beauty to do a tap, you know, when, when it works. Dr. Right. Felix? I'd like first to make a plug for our uh, conference tomorrow. For those hernia aficionados in the, off, in the audience who want to get more of this, we've got about six experts who are going to duke it out with gloves tomorrow afternoon, and I invite you to that lecture. But I'd like to make a couple of comments to you, Dr. Schweisberg. Number one, why are you afraid to tie off the round ligament? The gynecologists tell us there's something wrong with it. We've done it in thousands of patients and never had a problem, so I'm wondering why. Maybe it's your wife's power over you that's preventing it. <laughs> yeah, and well, it, I may be the next stage as president, but I confess to being completely whipped at home. So uh, please don't repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we erase that from the tape? You know, I, I don't believe in, in taking uh, – yes, you can do it. It doesn't harm people, and I certainly, you know, have done it open. And I just don't personally – because I take advantage of it to make my keyhole – so I can keep it from spinning. I take advantage of it, and I don't believe in taking structures that, you know, there's no benefit to taking the round ligament, either yeah. laparoscopically. I just, I found sometimes that it is the devil to get that sack off the round ligament in women, though. I mean, that's the problem that I have with it. But, but you do have to tie it off. There's a nice vessel in there, and we've seen one patient in our town that actually almost bled to death, fortunately not mine. So the Somewhere. pearl is tie it off, don't cut it off. No, yeah, don't well, just cut it, because it, if, unless you really cauterize it, yeah. You'll be back that evening. No, the real problem is leave it alone. No, can I, no, it should come out. The bleed, can I, Dan, can I just... Can I ask one more question to him? Yes, sir. Can I make a comment about the bleeding first, though? 
And just one in terms of selection, because I've seen this, and the bleeding triggered my uh, memory about this, but laparoscopic preperitoneal approach in somebody that's going back on anticoagulation, be very, very careful, okay? I mean, if they bleed into the groin, they get a hematoma, it's not that big a deal. But if they bleed in the preperitoneal space, there's a lot of capacity there. And so I'd be very careful in that population. Yeah, Last I would, question. I would, it's just supporting Dr. Braun's statement about closing the peritoneum, and I'm surprised that with the uh, staple technique you used, which was done eloquently, when you leave spaces, that you don't see the internal hernias, because many of us saw that early on and kind of abandoned that. So well, the, the space, East Coast must be nicer than the West Coast for that. Now, while yeah. you're here, Dr. Felix, you have one of the Landmark's paper, like 10,000 patients, showing the reasons that we see recurrences. And uh, just sort of one breath, can you kind of give well, us I the didn't five? want to get into that because one of the, the number one reasons from Barry McKernan, who was the first person to do, ever do a slit, was all his hernias were through the slit in the, hernia, in the uh, thing. So most people have abandoned the slit. The others were just lateral lift off. And we'll go over that. That's part of my talk tomorrow. So I don't want to... It's part of my so slides, so too, a, but don't hold back. No, I don't so, want to say. So that's a good technical point. People who make the slit make the hole too big. You don't need a very big hole. In fact, you... And so you need a way of bringing the two tails together. So by using... For me, using the stapler and just hooking the two limbs of the stapler on the mesh, I can recreate the internal ring pretty precisely. But, uh, Steve, when you, you... You circle the uh, cord structures. I mean, uh, do you... You don't see a higher grade risk of uh, postoperative pain when you've got the cord structures encircled by mesh. Um, it's you know after you've been measuring it for years, it's closed but not tight. Okay. No. Question over front. Joe from Tacoma. I'd like to know first, Mike, where you got that armband from? Is that here? Or did you bring that from St. Louis? I was. That was a gift from uh, Dr. Manabu Yamamoto. Wonderful. So uh, just to, and uh, to show support for our uh, Japanese colleagues in the tragedy in Japan. He also said I wasn't worthy of getting one because I asked to. They're really nice. <laughs> Secondly, um, your video is uh, wonderful. It's actually exactly why I do it. I use the same devices you do. But one little thing that, that we found is that that structural balloon when you replace the dissecting balloon distorts the midline. So if you, if you draw a nice dotted line showing where the midline is, your resident won't put the incision off midline. If you're trying to get them in the midline and afterwards they're kind of askew, the patient looks at you funny as all. Yeah, yeah, and my question for you all is, um, it seems to me that since there's concerns about you know, permanent devices, metal tacks, et cetera, or, or staples in there, why not use an absorbable spiral tacker? That's, that's what I've been using. It seems to me it gives you the best of both yeah. worlds. It gives you security during the immediate post-operative period where adhesions are forming for you. And then long term, if you happen to nail something, it's going to go away. Yeah, but I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I think one of the problems is having retrieved tacks from the skin you, you got, Mike is completely right. You've got to let the machine do the work. But once you've skewered a nerve, whether or not the, the tack goes away, it is completely unproven assertion that they won't have a permanent neuroma. Once you've damaged it, you've damaged it. And so there's a little bit of snake oil by saying, oh, good, all the problems go away. I, I've been back on a patient's head, absorbable tacks uh, after lap ventral hernia repair, and uh, they're still there at a year. So they stick around a long time. Question over here? Uh, have you guys tried any uh, single incision uh, laparoscopic uh, inguinal hernia? Personally, I've not. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Esteban Varela, has done some TEP um, single uh, port uh, or single site uh, lap incisional hernias. And um, I, we, we approach lap coles uh, that way in selected uh, patients, uh, but it's a little bit uh, more challenging, I think, to do that through a single site uh, preperitoneal space. So I can't. I can't comment on it further. I don't think, you know, honestly, these five millimeter incisions are not really very visible down the road. So, so I do a single por a single incision one, but it's called an open hernia repair. But the, <laughs> the, um, but but more to the point. In the early days, I used to use a twelve millimeter port laterally to uh, use the stapler. So if you looked how I configure it, I put my twelve millimeter port in the midline, and when it go to staple, I change to a five millimeter scope. And patients com used to complain of the only thing that bothered them was the port closure from the 12-millimeter port. Once I abandoned that and only had two little 5-millimeter scratches, and you could go to 3-millimeter ports, I, have, I haven't had a patient in a decade complain that there's any pain associated with the 5-millimeter ports. And when I go back and see these patients later, you know, for other things, you, you can't even see them. So I can't accrue a benefit from the single-port approach. Do you guys put a Foley in at all in preparation? No. 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 But again, that's why the whole issue about the fluids is key. And I'm telling you, you have to, you have to harp on it to, to your staff because, oh, well, the patient's been NPO, so I gave them, you know, 1,500 of fluid. Do you no. give them heparin? No. 
not, no, no, I, not for this. I, I, use, I, I use the boots, right. but no heparin. I make the patients pee uh, before they go into right. the OR. What I found is putting a Foley in stimulated the you know, prostatic urethra and, and raised my retention. Uh, antibiotics with the mesh? Yes. Yeah. I think, I think one, a single dose of antibiotics. I think um, the situation in which I would use a uh, urinary catheter is if it's a, it's, if it's a re-op. Uh, for uh, if a lap, you're operating on somebody that's uh, had a previous preperitoneal repair, or you're taking out mesh, so it's going to be a more difficult, longer operation. You need to, you may need to insufflate the bladder to see where it is. That would be the only situation. Question. I'm Sunil Popat, India. Excellent videos by both the presenters. I have a question for Professor Brunt. Uh, what is the size of mesh you are using? And in your video on left side, you use a physio mesh. Uh, do you right. routinely use physio mesh for right. this hernia? No, I don't uh, use anything routinely, but um, the mesh size is approximately 15 by 10 centimeters. Um, and uh, it, it is a key point because the, uh, one of the reasons early in the evolution of laparoscopic angle hernia repairs, recurrences happened because the mesh was too small. So that is a mesh size that will generally work for most patients. In a small individual, it might be a little bit big, but if you're just doing one side, a little bit of overlap is not a big deal. And um, I just started using some of the physio mesh, which has a lightweight polypropylene with uh, monocryl uh, coating on it. And um, but I haven't used it enough to be able to really give you a recommendation but about. But Mike, that. why use a coated mesh in the preperineum? Well, uh, the more dense uh, the, I mean, it's it's not like it's a true barrier coated mesh. I mean, you've still got the polypropylene. That's Steve, there, is so the mesh you're using going to be smaller when you're doing a tap? Uh, no, it, it's, it's, I make a big, it's easier when I do a tap, I can make a bigger space. I, you know, I think getting good coverage is important, but you know, one of the things that I've been impressed with is that there are emerging case reports of breakage of some of these lightweight meshes. And so you almost never hear of a standard weight polypropylene mesh break, but, um, Bruce Ramshaw in, in contributing to something that, uh, we're working on came up with several cases of broken lightweight mesh. And that was terrifying to me. Question. Erica Fellinger, Cambridge Health Alliance, um, actually just touched on my question, which was choice of mesh in those, uh, although they're uncommon, I've had the pleasure of doing like the redo, redos, who've had two open hernia surgeries and then a laparoscopic repair and still have a recurrence. Um, and, uh, you know, you go in, you do a tap, and the peritoneum is just shredded. And uh, how about using uh, coated meshes in those situations? Um, any other yeah, I think that's that? I think that's a good one because sometimes on, on the when the, when the prepared nil space has been violated and you have to with mesh, and you have to go back, uh, it's going to be difficult to preserve enough peritoneum that you can completely cover that mesh, and uh, and what I would do in that situation is I would probably pick some type of barrier coated polypropylene based mesh. I mean I've used PTFE mesh in that situation, but I worry a little bit in the preperitoneal space about the incorporation that you get, um, and uh, and so I would probably use a, a polypropylene-based barrier-coated mesh with the barrier facing out where the viscera are going to be. Question. Hi, Dave Renton from Ohio State. Um, I have a question about bilateral direct inguinal hernias. The one recurrence that I know of that I've had in the past two years, we don't, none of us know our true recurrence rates because they go to someone else to fix them is a very two large bilateral directs and I think within the first week I had overlapping meshes. I did tack down the middle but they just folded in like barn doors. What I've gone to doing now is taking a, ten, a 30 by 30 mesh, cutting it in a third, putting a 10 by 30 in there, marking the midline, tacking it to the Cooper's ligament and then spreading it out laterally so I have one piece of mesh. Have you guys ever tried that or had that incident? You, you know what, what you're describing is the mesh line turnia. Right. And, and this goes back to the patient selection issue and um, you know just because you can put a piece of mesh in laparoscopically doesn't they, those patients in whom the floor is truly destroyed mm -hmm. have a different kind of hernia problem than you know 99 percent of the routine cases and so when I look at those patients you know I tend to do them open and and I do a lot of suturing and anchoring a lot of thought to the to the support structures and, and sometimes I've done some cases where I've done part of it open and part of it laparoscopically over you know because because my laparoscopic part failed for what you're d describing right. but I but I think part of it is is that when they come and see me and I tell them they need an open hernia repair they're satisfied I know everybody in town so somebody will come and they'll say well this guy said laparoscopic hernia wasn't any good but the real thing he was saying to the patient is I don't know how to do it and I don't want to lose my case so if you can do both 
then you can really have a great discussion with the patient about what the most appropriate choice is for them. I haven't done that, but I, it's actually I, it maybe not a bad idea. And I, what you're describing, you're doing laparoscopically but what Juan's described as the giant prosthetic reinforcement right. of the visceral sac, mm -hmm. which, you know, was uh, it, being it, utilized it, for difficult recurrent hernias in the era before laparoscopic It, it is hernia. a difficult mesh to place yeah. with that large a piece, but it can be done. And it, I found it worked in the ones I found since then. Now, when you create that space, the extra perineal space, do you need to spend the extra 100 bucks for the balloon, or can we just bluntly dissect that with uh, some S retractors and plus a Hassan? Yeah, you don't have to. You can certainly do it that way. Um, and um, and uh, some hernia experts, uh, I think Marty Yaregi doesn't routinely use a balloon, for example. I see here. Um, but um, yeah, you can certainly do it. Um, it, it. It takes more time, and I think uh, the, the balloon just works so well, and it's quick, and you can see what you're doing with it. Um, that um, that's the way I do it. So, Steve, so I use the balloon for a different reason, and I didn't show any tap videos. But when I do a tap and I blow the balloon up, I actually put my pork directly into the balloon. So I use my balloon as a dissector and as a retractor. And if the balloon blows up. If it blows up perfectly symmetrically, and the modern versions of the balloon maybe are not not quite as good as the older versions of the balloon in some ways, but if but for whatever side I have my best dissection, I can you know push and look through the balloon, and I can be because I'm going to be out there nice and lateral, and I will drive it in one fell swoop dead center into the space of the balloon, and if you do it just right, the the balloon won't pop. You could actually get the second port in. You, not always, but but I get that first port in. And once you have the first port in, you can take the balloon out and insufflate, and it's easy to clean up the but other But the concept side. is you're protecting yourself from the aorta, and you're preventing the piece of bowel from getting trapped between the... Absolutely. Okay. So I use my balloon as a dissector and retractor uh, on my initial puncture, and that's why I still use a balloon. That's 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 an, I hadn't thought about that, Steve. That's a very interesting uh, idea. I may have to try that. When and you fill out your survey just, and it says, have you changed your practice, yeah. you can say yes. Sure, there you go. Uh, for part two or, MSC for or three you can months. Say, yeah. Or you can say you're going to do the scrotal wrap. Um, <laughs> All right, let's but, take uh, a vote. That, Who's going to go home and try the scrotal wrap? Just, <laughs> it's on themselves. It's, just, it's the brunt wrap. It's just, the brunt wrap, everybody. Like a, no, no, it's like a Nissan. Don't get it too tight, okay? So, but... Um, oh, what was I going to say? About, oh, I, what I was going to say about trocar insertion is... Um, it is possible to injure structures putting in your accessory ports, okay? It's been done. You can get iliac vessels, and it's all about having the, the, the visualization and the control so that you just slowly come through the, um, the abdominal wall and that you don't follow through and hit something in the retroperitoneum. It's not that far away. Question. Harun Patel from uh, Corpus Krispy Kreme, Texas. Uh, I was just wondering if... I, I just felt compelled to come up here because I worked with Steve and Denise. But my question is, having done this more than, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago as a general surgery resident and now doing exclusive pediatrics, am I, uh, what's your youngest age group? Am I uh, denying my teenagers the benefits of this procedure? Excuse my ignorance because I don't keep up with uh, this adult operation. Well, it depends on whether you think that a teenager has a congenital hernia or acquired hernia. So if they have an acquired, if you believe it's an acquired hernia, then there's no reason why they couldn't have a laparoscopic hernia repair, particularly if it, was, if it were bilateral. But if you philosophically believe it's a congenital hernia, then, then I would just ligate the sac like you would in a younger patient. Uh, I don't usually see um, uh, many teenagers, but um, I, I generally tend to do them open. Um, and again, I, it, most of them have small indirect uh, sacs and, uh, and are easily repaired. But, I mean, you could do them laparoscopically. Sometimes maybe they're still growing, so that's an issue as well. Dr. G, comment? I don't uh, see pediatric patients, but I agree with what Steve said. It depends if you think it's a congenital or acquired uh, hernia. I, I don't think that, you know, if it's an acquired hernia, I don't think that there's any reason why you couldn't offer them laparoscopic. Now, Mike, we get seromas. I mean, everyone gets yeah. these seromas after the TEP repair. Do you do anything with that pseudo sac to invert it, or do you just say, sort of tell everyone you're going to get a Well, yeah, that, that's a, a very good point. Um, and I, it, it's mainly a problem with the, with the uh, large direct sacs. And uh, this is actually a trick that I learned from David Edelman, uh, David Edelman, who was on the last panel. Um, and that is you've grabbed that pseudo sac, uh, evert it, and put a, a, a loop suture around it, a PDS loop suture, 
and that obliterates some of that dead space and will reduce your seroma incidence. So I've, I've tried to do that. Sometimes it's hard to get the thing all the way out. But I think it's important that you tell patients that you may get this and what to expect because then sometimes they'll come back and they say, I feel a lump, my hernia is still there, and it's just uh, the seroma, and we rarely uh, aspirate them. They typically and if you all tell them that just don't touch it and it'll go away faster, they never come back. <laughs> but, but, but all of these present as a message on your desk, you know, Mrs. Smith thinks that her hernia has come back, and it's like, okay, I'll see her tomorrow. I tend to see my patients back the, the week after surgery because it, if they have a seroma, they get immediate reassurance. If they have a hematoma, you know, they get immediately. But but what the, what the men most commonly call up with is they call up and they say that their penis is purple, you know, because it just takes a little bit of blood to dissect, you know, right on top of the penis. And so when I see these guys, I go, and there's no real hematoma there, just a little bit of staining, I can reassure them and say, you'll be fine, it'll be gone in a week. And often I don't need to see them back after that. So I'm an, you know, I, I'm an early post-op visitor as opposed to being a late post-op visitor. Yeah. The, the penis doesn't get purple if you do the scroll wrap. So. <laughs> <laughs> it turns pale. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it so falls you, off. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you create your space. You get a little tear uh, in the peritoneum. Do you endo loop that? Do you ignore it? Uh, do you do something else? Well, um, it, it's, it is fairly common, and sometimes you get, you get a little bit of uh, gas in the, in the peritoneal cavity even when you don't see a little tear. I think the little tiny things you can probably, through, you know, through a TEP approach, you can probably leave them alone not worry about them. But oftentimes we'll, it happens when you're peeling that sack off if it's big enough. Once I get it mobilized enough, I'll put a loop suture around it and secure it. Um, the other uh, thing that I would uh, state is that because it does happen, if I'm doing bilaterals, I like to go ahead and completely finish one side because maybe I get through that one side, I don't have any peritoneal uh, tear, I've got a good working space, I go ahead and put my mesh in and fix it before I go do the dissection on the other side because if you get a, a significant peritoneal tear on one side, your working space compromised, you haven't put any mesh in, it's just going to make it more difficult. I do the same. I've stuck a varus needle, you know, transabdominally to try to deflate the abdominal side. It doesn't work very good. It's, it, can, it can really uh, be annoying. And, you know, some people talk about trying to convert to, you know, to tap and all that. You can usually operate your way through it. And if, it's, and if it happens in the sac, yes, you can ligate the sac. But sometimes you can't even see where the hole's coming from. Would you ever clip it? I, I usually doesn't work very well. Yeah, it just uh, falls I think, off. Um, I, and I, I have had tears big enough. I mean, I've a handful of times have put that TEP balloon uh, through the peritoneum in the peritoneal cavity, and then what do you do? Do you convert to a TAP? That's certainly one option. Or I've even uh, occasionally just sutured that defect closed and then gone on and finished the repair. So do we get consensus on the minimum size mesh that we need? Or the, or the maximum amount of overlap minimum or more, you know, we need? I think you should, your mesh should come to the midline, and it should be, you know, at least probably three, three uh, centimeters lateral to the indirect space, and, um, and you need to have probably three centimeters uh, below the superior ramus of the pubis. Um, in most patients, a 15 by 10 centimeter mesh will, will do that. Yeah, I use about the same size. Anyone disagree with a 10 by 15 polypropylene mesh? Okay, so everyone's agreeing that it needs to be really big, so great. Glue. Any reason to put the glue in? You know, I think ultimately we will figure out how to do this, but, it, you know, it's, it's kind of messy. And, uh, but I think that there are people working on clever ways to use adhesives to fix the mesh that will eliminate the need for the absorbable tax. The absorbable tax are very expensive. Um, I, you know, I'm going to wait for the folks working on it, but I think that's probably the future. What's the maximum number of clips that you can put in there? Is there a clipping foul after a certain number of tacks? Well, peritoneum aside, because when I do the peritoneum, as you can see, I just close them to the peritoneum so there's no foul. Um, for me, it's one or two on Coopers, one laterally, one medially. Um, you know, three or four is, is my max. I, I have five or six. Uh, I think you get double digits, you're, you're kind of a little bit out of bounds. How many folks here for their TEPs put no tacks in at all, no glues, just set it in perfectly and maybe a preformed mesh or not? Uh, Dr. Felix, you want to speak to that at all? All I'm going to say is 
I don't fix, but tomorrow I'm debating the side that you should fix. So we'll let the people come tomorrow. We'll give them a teaser. You're using all of my time to, to pitch that. What time is it again? No. <laughs> well, Next I, question. You know, 30 to 5 in this house. I would, I would just uh, point out, though, that Dr. Felix is one of the most experienced uh, hernia surgeons in the world. And, you know, and so uh, whatever approach that he takes, he's going to get good results. Question, please. San Chong from University of Iowa. My question for any of you out there, thanks for all the um, great talk. Um, do any of you have any experience in like patients with pain and how do you work them out and how do you manage them? Well, I see more patients with chronic pain than I'd like. I have a, a sports hernia practice, so a lot of that's pain that we're dealing with. And I think that, um, that, w that what's important when, if a patient comes back after an inguinal hernia repair with pain is that you take a stepwise approach, okay? In most cases, they will get better with time. And so you do the usual conservative things. You have them ice on a regular basis. Maybe you put them on an anti-inflammatory. If you're concerned that it might be neuropathic, you might even put them on a neuromodulator for a short course, something like Neurontin or that sort of thing. If they have a very focal area of pain, usually not at the first post-operative visit, but a little bit further down the road, then um, I will uh, I'll either send them to physical therapy and have them get some what's called ART, active release technique, a little scar massage, loosen things up, or I will do a local injection. And typically I reserve that. I don't do a block like you would for an open hernia repair, but I will, in, if they have a focal area of where their pain seems to be the main nidus of pain, then I'll inject them with local anesthetic and sometimes I'll mix that with a little bit of steroid as well. And so I think you go through that kind of stepwise progression and occasionally there are patients that have what truly sounds like neuropathic pain, they are not getting better, and it's that small subset that you end up sometimes having to reoperate on and take out mesh and or tax or resect nerves. So, so, so I used to work downtown, so you know they all all those pain patients migrate to the uh, urban jungle, and and having done a lot of this, it, it all starts with a history, and the history is when did your pain start. Um, and then after that, it's, it's about mapping the, the pain distribution of, of, the, of the patient because certain things make more sense than others. You know, it, is the pain in the ilioinguinal nerve? Is it in the iliohypogastric nerves? Is it in the, in the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve? But I agree with Michael. You know, when, when, they, when they show up early, you know, the answer to the question is uh, time and you, know, you can try some you know, muscle relaxants and things like that and buy some more time. But without, without a good nerve mapping. So the most complicated case I ever saw was a lap hernia done by somebody else. And the pain, I, I wasn't as thoughtful about it as I am now. The pain it was in the ilioinguinal region. And that's pretty weird after a lap hernia, but I was too stupid to realize it and went and took out a whole bunch of their tacks, and including tacks that had gone through the skin. So I did this whole big thing laparoscopically where I took out all their tacks and they still had pain in the ilioinguinal region. So I was kind of desperate and I said, listen, this doesn't make any sense, but I will explore your groin open. And what I found, and you, know, you can go look up the reference, what I found is that they had managed by grace of bad luck to have skewered the ilioinguinal nerve from the inside using a tack um, by pushing too hard and drove it all the way through the groin and skewered the nerve. And I have this picture of the ilioinguinal nerve pinned down by a tack placed laparoscopically. So the, my approach to pain is really good history, really good physical, and give everything you can to let tincture of time take it away if it's in anywhere early in the post-operative period. Mike. A couple other points. One is if, if this was a patient that was operated on by someone else that was sent to you, I would strongly advise you to get your hands on that operative note and review it, find out exactly what's done. There may be clues into it as to why the patient has the pain. And the other thing is if it's a laparoscopic repair, particularly if it, again, if it was someone else who did it, get a plain x-ray of the pelvis. That'll give you an idea of how many tacks, distribution, and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. You have to get the original op notes. Most of them won't tell you anything, but every now and then you'll get a nugget. And in the nugget in this case that I described was the, all the incredible good force they used to place those tacks through. And what happened is that the abdominal wall got compressed, and as the abdominal wall opened up, it took the tack with it, uh, anteriorly, and so if you're getting a patient, you, you, you absolutely need their op notes to avoid avoid surprises. Question, please. Tim Lemire from Minnesota. It's a question about the uh, uh, tackless, self-adherent uh, polyester meshes. What are your thoughts? Well, they talk about that zipper-like effect, but you know, I think 
doesn't do it for me as well as the folks say it does. Yeah, really minimal experience. I, I, I don't know, I prefer to, to uh, secure it myself. In our last uh, minute, uh, how do you go about getting the best training to do laparoscopic repairs if you're in practice right now? Boy, that, that's, a, that's a tough one. If you're starting all by yourself, you, know, I mean, you need to be a, a reasonably good laparoscopist to start with. Uh, I think it's easier to start by doing taps. There's some technical demands by doing, you know, having to open and close the peritoneum, but you're less likely to get lost, and it gives you a, a, a reasonable approach. But I think going and mentoring with people that already do it, or if you have a partner that's already doing it, you know, particularly the TEP where you're working in a small space, nothing beats good mentoring and a really good ad anatomy education. Uh, I would echo what Steve said. I mean, I think you've done part of that because you're all here and the learning about some of the little, I think this is, lap angle hernia repair is one of those things where a lot of the little details really make an impact on how the course of the operation goes. But it can't emphasize enough the anatomy, watching somebody who knows how to do it, go and watch them, observe them, and, 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 um, and go from there. Well, I see we still have a couple questions. Our speakers will meet you in the back and be happy to answer them. I'd like to thank all of you for making an interactive discussion, really challenging our speakers. I know they're going to go get some water right now. Thank you all, and we'll resume in five minutes, five minutes for the next session.